Welcome back to my channel, and if you're new here, make sure to hit the subscribe button for more captivating stories like this. The story starts in a bustling train station, people went about their own business. Some were waiting for their stop, while others wanted to cross the train tracks. As the lights turned green, indicating it was safe to cross, a woman with her baby was the first to step onto the tracks. However, to everyone's horror, the train experienced a brake malfunction and continued to speed forward uncontrollably. Passengers began to panic and desperately jumped off the train, screaming for help. The people nearby warned others of the danger, urging them to run. The woman, frantically pulling her baby's stroller, pleaded for assistance, but the onlookers could do nothing more than yell for her to escape. They wanted to help, but the fear of a catastrophic accident overpowered their desire to intervene. Suddenly, a mysterious man appeared out of nowhere in the crowd. Without hesitation, he bravely stepped onto the tracks to save the terrified mother and her child. Using his bare hands, he managed to stop the train, causing the cars to collide. The mother, fearing the worst, closed her eyes, expecting the end. However, when she opened them, she was astonished to find herself and her baby unharmed, saved from the impending disaster. Standing before her was the mysterious man, who helped her to her feet and checked if she was alright. The mother was grateful and in awe of the stranger's heroism, but as she glanced at him once more, she was taken aback. The man had the face of a skull, and both the mother and child were filled with terror, believing that death had come for them. Meanwhile, in a different setting, Zombie woke up and began his daily routine. He went by the name Zombie, as he had no recollection of his true identity, age, or the circumstances of his death. Despite his frightening appearance, resembling death itself, Zombie harbored a dream, a dream of befriending humans and breaking free from the discrimination and ostracization he faced. With this dream in mind, Zombie dedicated himself to self-improvement, even though it seemed impossible due to his appearance. He believed that through hard work, he could overcome these obstacles. Zombie believed that by helping countless humans and performing heroic acts like the one on the train tracks, he could make his dream a reality. For instance, he once single-handedly prevented a plane from crashing into a football stadium, carrying its weight on his shoulders. However, people were too distracted by his looks to appreciate his good deeds. Similarly, when a fire broke out in a condominium, Zombie rescued trapped children and called for firefighters and their parents. Yet, their reactions mirrored those at the football stadium, rejecting him based on his appearance. Despite his current strength, Zombie wasn't always as powerful as he remembered. In the past, during a summer, a zombie outbreak occurred, leading to an apocalyptic scenario with severe pollution. Zombie was a student at the time, but he was unable to escape and ended up getting bitten. Consequently, he became an ordinary zombie, mindlessly wandering and driven by an insatiable hunger for human flesh and blood. However, humans eventually appeared, armed with guns and missiles. They viewed the zombies as a threat and used them as a fuel source, even creating a perpetual energy machine. Zombie didn't understand why zombies craved humans or why humans sought to exterminate them. To survive, Zombie realized he had to change his lifestyle. From that day forward, he embarked on a rigorous training regimen, determined to become something more than just an ordinary zombie. He engaged in a daily routine of weightlifting, running, swimming, and jumping. Each day, he lived an independent life, relying on his own efforts. Zombie maintained a vegetarian diet, consuming protein powder for all three meals. Despite feeling tired, he persisted in his training, even exercising at night. Over time, Zombie became exceptionally strong and muscular, almost invincible. With his newfound power and knowledge, he decided to integrate into human society, aiming to change people's perception of zombies. Zombie aspired to live as a civilized and law-abiding individual, dedicated to doing good. Returning to his daily routine, Zombie realized he had run out of food. Opening the fridge, he contemplated going shopping to restock. On a sunny day, he headed to the supermarket. There, a friendly cashier struck up a conversation and asked if Zombie found wearing a mask uncomfortable after a long day. It was evident that the supermarket employees were unaware of Zombie's identity. The cashier instructed the employees to assist Zombie in loading his purchased items onto his truck. Remarkably, Zombie didn't just buy a few eggs but a substantial quantity, as if he owned an egg market. While Zombie went about his day, two individuals began to stalk him from behind a bush out of curiosity, intending to remove his mask and uncover his identity.
Observing Zombie closely, they continued to tail him even after he completed his errands. Zombie frowned as he examined a piece of paper he was holding. It turned out to be a wanted poster featuring someone he knew named Aku. The poster indicated that Aku had an extremely high danger level, categorized as SSS. Aku was like a boss level zombie, with a bounty of 9,999,226. Meanwhile, the stalkers began searching and stalking Zombie, recalling the time he effortlessly lifted an entire airplane on a football field. The cameraman expressed skepticism, suspecting the media had exaggerated the incident. Despite the doubts, the individual with a mustache remained fixated on Zombie, unable to take his eyes off him. The stalkers, however, started to consider the possibility that the media had sensationalized Zombie's abilities. They took a risk and continued following him to satisfy their curiosity. Engrossed in conversation, the stalkers momentarily diverted their attention from Zombie. When they refocused, their eyes widened in shock as they witnessed Zombie's incredible strength. He effortlessly lifted a truck, causing the ground to crack, and then soared into the sky, holding the truck as if he were Superman. Even astronauts aboard a spacecraft were bewildered by Zombie's display of power. In an abandoned city, inhabited by sentient zombies, they exhibited independent thoughts and emotions, unlike typical mindless zombies. Hunger plagued the zombie citizens, and a child zombie complained to his mother. She urged him to endure it for a while. That night, Zombie descended from the night sky, landing with the truck he had purchased earlier. The zombie citizens hailed him as the king of their kind. The child suggested that Zombie should have driven the truck to their abandoned city, imitating humans. However, Zombie explained that he lacked a driver's license. The children gained new knowledge about the outside world. The abandoned city was a place Zombie had conquered, far away from human scrutiny. He instructed his fellow zombies to replace the protein they obtained from consuming human flesh with eggs. The zombie citizens eagerly feasted on the eggs Zombie had bought. Seeking information about Aku, Zombie inquired with the child, who pointed towards the hotel in the city's center. Zombie ventured inside the hotel to meet other powerful zombies, akin to himself. Zombie encountered his kind, who appeared to be powerful and intimidating. Creatures, resembling mythical high-level beings. Aku, the individual featured on the wanted poster Zombie had seen earlier. The boss zombies, Varmint and Blackie, were also present, both possessing boss-level zombie status with a danger level of SSS, considered to be at the top tier. Despite being the smallest among them, Zombie commanded respect, being referred to as, Their Majesty. Zombie entered the room with a sense of disappointment towards Aku, who had committed heinous crimes against humans due to his uncontrollable predatory instincts. Taking a seat on the couch, Zombie exuded a regal air, akin to a king on his throne. His purpose for visiting was not only to provide sustenance for his fellow zombies but also to receive reports from his henchmen. Blackie stepped forward to report on various issues, mentioning the challenges they faced in hiding from humans while steadily increasing their numbers. Varmint interjected, expressing his desire to engage in battle with humans and highlighting the deterioration of his chainsaw due to the lack of fresh blood. Zombie cautioned Varmint not to underestimate humans, as they could be terrifying. Meanwhile, in the vicinity, a plane belonging to a political organization approached the abandoned city. The woman in charge, who emitted a leader-like aura, examined the data statistics and prepared to drop a massive bomb, a nuclear warhead, on the city. She harbored a deep-seated anger and prejudice toward zombies, possibly due to past traumatic experiences. While the Air Force plane awaited the opportune moment to release the bomb, the boss zombie sensed the imminent danger. Varmint, driven by naivety, suggested confronting the humans, but Zombie, acting as a responsible leader, forbade him from doing so, aware that Varmint would lose control upon contact with humans. Instead, Zombie ordered the other boss zombies to evacuate while he personally confronted the impending threat. Not only was the city under threat from the plane, but ground units were also preparing to open fire on any zombies they encountered. The organization instructed his henchmen to evacuate and protect the civilians for the next 20 minutes, fully aware of the chaos that awaited them. The organization behind the attack displayed meticulous planning, employing both aerial and ground forces, as well as a highly skilled combatant determined to eliminate zombies. The zombie citizens, despite their decaying and mutated appearances, displayed a unique expression of fear towards humans. Their primary instinct was to flee and preserve their undead lives. Meanwhile, 
Inside the plane, a man resembling a mad scientist, named Fei, observed the data statistics and received information that the Extraordinaries Academy had discovered the zombies first. Fei, driven by his inhumane experiments, pushed a red button, revealing his plan to use human beings as bait for the zombies. The humans confined within the cage were filled with terror and screaming for help, their eyes reflecting fear and desperation. They found themselves in a situation they never signed up for. Suddenly, the cage containing the humans was dropped, and the zombies launched a surprise attack. As the humans faced this ambush, a ground unit named Timo received information about human life detected in the area and ordered his team to proceed to the marked location to rescue the caged humans. The army positioned their machine guns strategically at the ends of the road, intending to prevent the zombies from escaping, and began shooting at them. However, they soon realized that the zombies couldn't be killed. In the midst of the chaos, a zombie child held their sibling tightly, both facing their impending demise. But their leader, Zombie, the majestic and revered figure, stepped in and shielded the zombie child and their sibling from the bullets, saving them. One soldier, believing that there was no such thing as an invincible zombie, became angered and fired a rocket launcher at the zombies. The explosion interrupted his comrades, who informed him that the zombie he had shot was actually known as, the Extraordinary, a figure revered by human society for helping people. The soldier, stunned by his mistake, looked at the information on the Extraordinary and realized it was Zombie, famous for always wearing a zombie mask. Meanwhile, Zombie, unaffected by the explosion, stood resolute, ready to save anyone he could. In the Air Force, another skilled individual received information that a boss zombie had been detected in Zone B. Without hesitation, he dived from the plane, fearless and determined. Back with the mad scientist Fei and his colleague, they observed how the zombie bosses had managed to save most of the zombie civilians, realizing that they had underestimated the zombies who possessed a sense of self. In a cruel act, Fei used his colleague as bait by dropping a cage filled with humans, leading to the zombie civilians ambushing them, their hunger for human flesh reawakened after a prolonged deprivation. A particularly starved zombie began to transform into a huge mutant zombie, catching zombies' attention. It turned out that the mutant zombie was the boss zombie that the army had detected in Zone B. As the skilled combatant dove into Zone B, the squad that had wrongly shot zombie, mistaking him for the extraordinary, was also informed of the situation. They immediately responded, stating that they were on their way, but the squad leader, burdened by the weight of almost killing an innocent person, panicked and ran towards zombie. The squad leader believed he had severely injured zombie and desperately tried to save his life. The rest of the squad reluctantly followed their leader's order, driven by a lack of alternatives. The red-haired girl in the squad, still under the impression that Zombie wore a mask, became curious about his identity and wondered why he wore it every day. Zombie nervously laughed, revealing that he actually had no mask, it was just his bare face. In Zone B, as the soldier team fought the boss Zombie, they contemplated how they could defeat it, especially now that it had transformed into a powerful mutant. The boss zombie, growling like a bloodthirsty monster, lifted a bus and prepared to attack the soldier team. Suddenly, a skilled combatant named Marshall, from the Academy Swordsmanship Club, arrived on the scene. With a swift and precise strike, Marshall sliced the bus in half, filling the soldier team with hope and confidence in their chances of victory with Marshall on their side. Marshall assumes his position, waiting for the boss zombie's next attack. He orders the soldier team to rescue the human civilians and evacuate immediately. Marshall is confident in his ability to defeat the boss zombie on the other side, where the squad leader and his team are assisting the human civilians in their evacuation. While saving the human civilians, they discuss the squad leader's team's situation. The squad leader inquires about the boss zombie's whereabouts, and the team informs him that Marshall has already arrived and engaged the boss zombie. They are relieved to hear that Marshall is already in battle since he is known as a formidable opponent. Meanwhile, Zombie, who was dragged along by the squad leader, cannot stay idle due to the presence of the boss zombie they are discussing, which seems to be someone Zombie knows named Little Knight. The red-haired girl, occupied with her task of helping people, senses that Zombie has left the area, and wonders where he could have gone. In Zone B, where Marshall fights the boss zombie, he locks eyes with the zombie and empathizes with it. He discovers a human being trapped in a decaying body. Marshall asks the zombie if it is hurt, but the terrifying boss zombie growls in response and launches an attack on Marshall. Marshall, 
a skilled swordsman, swiftly unsheaths his katana and slices through the boss zombie with lightning speed. His intention is not just to kill but to free them from their decaying bodies. The boss zombie momentarily freezes, and then its body begins to disintegrate into pieces, a result of being sliced by a highly skilled swordsman like Marshall. After completing his task, Marshall readies himself to leave but notices another zombie. It is Zombie, mourning the loss of the zombie that Marshall killed. Zombie stares at the sliced corpse in silence. In the Air Force, they receive a report that Marshall has successfully defeated the boss zombie, and everyone cheers for him. The Air Force president orders her team to document the event as part of their contribution. In Zone B, Zombie, still grieving for his friend, apologizes for the zombie's lack of control, asserting that it is no one's fault. Marshall suddenly realizes that Zombie is one of the zombies he has been fighting against and immediately swings his sword, yelling that all zombies must die. Meanwhile, in the Air Force, while Marshall engages in a fight with Zombie, the team detects another boss-level zombie. They remain calm and overestimate Marshall, assuming he will defeat the boss zombie in an instant. However, the girl observing the data feels uneasy as it indicates that the fight between Marshall and Zombie has already concluded, but Marshall is nowhere to be found. In Zone B, Marshall clings to a pole, severely injured from his encounter with Zombie. Although Zombie seems calm, he continues to mourn his friend who was sliced into pieces. Zombie did not immediately kill Marshall but left him in critical condition. Panic ensues among the Air Force team as they observe that Marshall's life signals are nearly gone due to his critical injuries. Additionally, they worry that they have not yet evacuated all the human civilians. Their president, angered by the situation and her prejudice against zombies, disappears from the plane and parachutes down to assist the ground units in defeating the zombies. The team on the plane advises caution, suggesting they first assess the strength of the boss zombie before engaging. However, the president, wielding her sword, chants the name of her technique, White Blade Cleave, as she descends from the sky like a shooting star. When she strikes Zombie, her sword shatters upon impact, leaving the president in awe of Zombie's invincibility. As the president attempts to fight Zombie, her team constantly warns her that she cannot recklessly charge without informing them, as they will be unable to provide support for her impulsive actions. The president stands firmly, observing her opponent, realizing that she must not underestimate it, or she will suffer the same fate as Marshall and Zombie. Zombie apologizes for putting Marshall in critical condition and expresses his concern about being hated by humans despite working hard to be accepted by society. The president begins to suspect that Zombie may be a mutant or a variant of the zombies they have encountered before. She reaches for her second sword, determined to fight Zombie once again, fueled by her deep hatred for him. The president invokes her powerful sword technique called, Enhanced Blade, but Zombie tries to initiate a conversation and seeks to resolve the misunderstandings. Ignoring Zombie's words, the president charges at him, but Zombie swiftly evades her. Attack. The president retreats momentarily to prepare her next move, Red Blade Cleave, which causes significant destruction to the surrounding infrastructure. However, Zombie simply bends over to dodge the attack effortlessly. Frustrated and stressed by Zombie's skills and abilities, the president becomes consumed by her desire to kill him with her own hands. Meanwhile, the rest of the team manages to save Marshall, who is in critical condition, and tries to comfort him as he speaks incoherently. The Air Force team grows increasingly concerned for their president's safety and repeatedly advises her to retreat, informing her that all the human civilians have been evacuated. In Zone B, both Zombie and the president continue their chaotic battle. Zombie remains focused on saving others before the organization bombs the city, while the president has forgotten the mission to evacuate civilians due to her intense hatred for the zombies. She is determined to kill Zombie, not only because he injured one of her team members but also out of pure animosity. The president questions why Zombie would run away in the middle of their battle, to which Zombie responds that he has more important tasks to attend to and that he cannot trust the president's intentions, as she seeks to cut him in half. The president activates her level 2 sword technique, Lotto level 2, drawing and sheathing her blade in rapid succession. Additionally, she utilizes her advanced technology boots, which grant her rocket-like propulsion. With these enhancements, she launches herself towards Zombie. Finally catching up to him, the president swings her sword and successfully strikes Zombie, knocking him to the ground. Satisfied, the president believes she has eliminated her target and calls for her team to lower the plane's altitude to pick her up. Meanwhile, the mad scientist Faye receives news that all the human civilians, 
who were supposed to be fed to the zombies, have been rescued. Fei remembers that they have a spy working with the organization, whom he plans to sabotage. The rescued civilians express their joy and gratitude to the soldiers. However, unbeknownst to the rest of the team, one of the Air Force pilots, who is secretly working with the spy, exhibits suspicious behavior, manipulating the plane's controls. Suddenly, the spy presses a red button, triggering the launch of a nuclear warhead towards the civilians. Unaware of the sabotage, celebrates their success in saving the civilians, hoping to reunite with their families. The pilot urgently warns everyone not to celebrate yet, revealing the presence of a traitor among them and the imminent threat of the nuclear explosion that has already been initiated. The team is shocked and enters a state of panic as they realize the gravity of the situation. The president's sense of relief vanishes instantly as stress engulfs her mind upon receiving the shocking news. Her team informs her that an enemy spy has successfully infiltrated their ranks and has deployed the nuclear warhead, causing great alarm. The president's gaze fixates on the sky, her mind racing as she comprehends the gravity of the situation unfolding before her. In the distance, she spots an imminent nuclear explosion that threatens to annihilate the entire city within minutes. The president's team quickly receives the alert and prepares for the turbulence that awaits them. They swiftly make arrangements to open the cabin doors and lower the altitude to allow the president to board the aircraft. To ensure their escape from the impending blast, the president must utilize her leg booster, the same one she used to pursue zombie earlier. As the president makes a desperate attempt to escape, her team urges her to board the plane. Immediately, however, to her dismay, the leg booster fails to function, leading to regretful thoughts about the time she wasted during her pursuit of zombie. In her frustration, she turns to her left and senses that she is being watched. To her surprise, she sees zombie staring directly at her, seemingly eavesdropping on her internal monologue. Without warning, zombie grabs the president and spins her around, not as an act of revenge but to propel her towards the plane. The president screams as she is thrown through the air like a baseball, eventually landing inside the aircraft on her feet. Her team rushes to her aid, assisting her as she takes a deep breath to regain her composure. Though grateful for their support, the president's anger towards Zombie persists, fueled by his continued survival. Meanwhile, Zombie remains on the ground, contemplating how to prevent the nuclear explosion from decimating the abandoned city, potentially killing both humans and zombie civilians alike. With determination, Zombie huffs and breaks the ground beneath him, propelling himself into the air with the speed of a rocket. He launches himself towards the nuke, relying solely on his bare hands. He refers to his attack as the bare-handed nuclear warhead catch, a technique he recently invented. Witnessing this heroic act, both the organization and the mad scientist are amazed by Zombie's immense strength. A massive explosion erupts in the sky, demonstrating the effectiveness of Zombie's intervention. The airplane is thrown off balance as a powerful explosion jolts them. A mushroom-shaped explosion accompanied by a halo of smoke indicates its intensity. The president struggles to grasp the reality of the situation as the building burns and the aftermath of the nuclear explosion unfolds. As the smoke gradually dissipates, the president anxiously awaits Zombie's fate. Suddenly, Zombie's feet emerge from the smoke, and to everyone's surprise, he is unscathed except for his torn clothes. Nonchalantly, Zombie scratches his butt, as the explosion left him with an itchy rear end. Amidst the chaos, the mad scientist, Fei, decides to abandon their current location, convinced that their sabotage of Binder's Academy is not yet complete. However, Fei's partner analyzes the data and discovers signs of life in the area affected by the explosion. This realization prompts Fei to reconsider their departure, acknowledging that their encounters with Binder's Academy are far from over. With determination, the mad scientists make their preparations to leave the area. On the Binder's Academy's plane, the president is overwhelmed with embarrassment and a sense of shattered dignity. She keeps her head low, unable to speak, while two members of her team express concern for her well-being. One member, however, comprehends the president's emotional state, recognizing the irony that she, who has dedicated her life to fighting against Zombie, ended up being saved by him in the end. This understanding prompts the team member to approach the president, attempting to provide clarity regarding Zombie's true identity. Despite their advanced technology, the team still considers Zombie to be a human-masked hero who has gained considerable fame. Their investigations confirm that Zombie has been living in the city for some time, choosing to conceal his identity. 
The president clutches her tablet tightly, frustration etched on her face as she struggles to come to terms with the situation. She feels dumbfounded, reminiscent of the previous leader of the squad who faced a similar predicament. As the incident subsides, the afternoon sun casts a serene atmosphere, but the people remain terrified of Zombie as he passes by, appearing like a vagrant. Seeking solace, Zombie enters a payphone booth and eagerly contacts his friends. Their response reassures Zombie that everyone has escaped unscathed, alleviating his worries about their safety. Everyone was fine in searching for a new residence. Zombies, relieved, were promised by someone to reconnect if they found a new place. Following a long, stressful day, Zombie finally returned home to relax. However, just as he was about to enter his apartment, the Binders Academy tracked him down by hacking into Zombie's security camera. They observed Zombie about to enter his place, but he sensed their presence and stared back at them. The president and her team were startled. Meanwhile, Zombie, trying to unwind, was working out to the tune of Face Off by Tech 9 and featuring The Rock, thinking of his friends, whom he considers family, and pondering if they had settled down. Unexpectedly, the president of the Founders Academy paid Zombie an uninvited visit, ordering her security team to strip Zombie's apartment bare, taking everything from the kitchen to the bedroom. Disturbed and contemplating calling the police, Zombie was presented with a legal document introducing the Binders Academy. The president informed Zombie that he had been accepted into the academy, making him a member without his consent. Despite Zombie's resistance, the president ordered her security to forcibly remove him from his home. The situation escalated as Zombie fought back against the security guards, who sustained injuries while trying to remove him. Eventually, Zombie was placed in the Binders Academy's vehicle. A red-headed team member expressed doubts about the president's decision, questioning the appropriateness of enlisting Zombie solely on her command. She highlighted the academy's strict recruitment criteria and raised concerns about accommodations since every dormitory was carefully planned. Despite objections, the president insisted on recruiting Zombie, citing his potential to benefit the academy. In the meantime, the security personnel carried out the president's directive, confiscating all of Zombie's essentials and unpacking them at her residence. Zombie remained perplexed by the president's abrupt intrusion. They exchanged glances, each seemingly waiting for the other to present their viewpoint first. Zombie, visibly intimidated, inquired whether he would be staying at her place. The president responded with a matter-of-fact tone, causing Zombie a brief moment of panic due to her unsettling assumption that he might share her bed. This awkward conclusion momentarily unnerved Zombie, imagining a scenario of interspecies relations, which he deemed impossible. The president informed Zombie that he would be lodging in her guest room, but Zombie hesitated, considering confessing his non-human nature. However, the president appeared disinterested, busying herself with her boots. Zombie grew agitated until the president revealed her robotic leg, explaining that she had amputated her own limbs. She recounted her traumatic past, where a zombie outbreak led to her parents becoming infected, forcing her to take drastic measures for survival, instilling within her a deep-seated hatred for zombies. Upon hearing the president's backstory, Zombie chose to remain silent about his identity. Fortunately for him, the president did not catch his confession. Instead, he clumsily changed the subject, inquiring about the Binders Academy. The president explained that the academy specialized in devising strategies to combat zombies, tracing its origins back to the initial outbreak a millennium ago. She emphasized its role in nurturing individuals to combat zombie threats. Despite Zombie's feigned ignorance of the history, the president remained preoccupied, instructing him to report to the academy the next day, as she had already enrolled him through clandestine means. Reluctant to comply, Zombie was threatened with investigation by the academy's experts if he attempted to flee. The president, introducing herself as Violet, warned Zombie not to evade his responsibilities. She mentioned Don, a member of her team, who would escort him to the academy. The following day, Don, a red-headed girl, arrived to take Zombie to the Binders Academy. Don warmly greets Zombie, calling him her little masked brother. However, Zombie looks at her with confusion and asks who she is. This angers Don, reminding him that they were together in the armored personnel carrier. After a moment of contemplation, Zombie recalls that she was much smaller back then and gestures to indicate her height. Don tries to calm herself down, reminding herself not to argue with her classmate, believing it would be best to avoid conflict. Internally, she repeats the thought that Zombie is just an idiot. Don walks away, 
urging Zombie to follow as it's time for the entrance exam. However, Zombie is still confused about the exam. As they walk through the academy, they realize they are the only ones not in the venue. Zombie asks if he has to take the entrance exam, and Don replies affirmatively, mentioning that it's standard for schools to have entrance exams. She explains that the exam will test both his physical abilities and his special skills for killing zombies. For example, she mentions that the world record for the 100 meters sprint is 9.58 seconds, so they need to finish the 100 meters in 9.57 seconds to pass. Zombie realizes that this is the meaning of, Beander, in Beander Academy. Don asks him what he thought it meant, but Zombie just scratches his head, unable to provide an answer. Feeling the weight of the Academy's expectations, Zombie couldn't help but view it as a gathering of eccentric individuals in a bizarre asylum. A few minutes passed, and individuals congregated for their entrance exam, displaying determination and readiness. The crowd brimmed with anticipation, awaiting instructions. In the midst of the crowd, Zombie carried Don on his shoulder to help her overcome her height disadvantage. However, a bald man grew annoyed and cursed at Don for inconveniencing him. Despite this, Don maintained her composure. Zombie posed a hypothetical question, indirectly referring to himself, questioning whether someone with exceptional abilities in a human city would bypass the entrance exam. Don clarified that the academy operated without favoritism, citing examples of individuals with extraordinary talents. She explained that the academy, overseen by the old government, harbored secrets, and most students paid little attention to external news. Amidst the crowd, a middle-aged man with a peg leg arrived to oversee the entrance exam. This examiner, Chen, served as the president of the sports department. Before commencing the exam, Chen delivered a brief history of the prestigious academy, aiming to inspire the applicants. However, his speech was interrupted when Zombie called out to him, expressing concerns about zombies within the academy. Chen nonchalantly remarked on the grim fate awaiting any zombies found on the premises, causing Zombie to react with a blank expression. As the entrance exam commenced, the applicants focused intently, awaiting the referee's signal to begin sprinting. With most applicants possessing remarkable abilities, they dashed with such speed that their movements appeared invisible to the naked eye. The first to reach the finish line was an orange-headed individual named Wu Chengsu, who completed the race in a stunning three seconds. Meanwhile, during the shooting test, applicants concentrated on their aim as Chen emphasized shooting as a fundamental skill in combating zombies. Zombie, feeling compelled to participate in a combat-focused environment rather than learning theoretical knowledge about his kind, observed another strong applicant, Don, who effortlessly dispatched targets with precision. Don also excelled in the shooting test, displaying pride in her abilities. Zombie felt a sense of humiliation in the presence of the formidable applicants, particularly as some failed the test and directed their frustration towards the straw figure. Throughout the experience, Zombie remained nervous. As they proceeded to the next test, known as the shot put, Chen explained the requirements, hitting a minimum of 80 meters to pass and 100 meters to qualify. Under Chen's watchful eye, the applicants began throwing the heavy ball. Chen called out those who succeeded or failed, moving on to the next group. Zombie, attempting to conceal his true strength to avoid suspicion, fell trapped among what he perceived as lunatics. Chen scrutinized Zombie's data, noting his height and weight, as recommended by Violet for his extraordinary strength. Despite this, Chen doubted Zombie's capabilities, given his modest performance. The day's tests continued, with another throwing range examination. Cheng Su demonstrated his strength by launching the spear, aiming precisely at the target. Zombie observed, feeling a twinge of discomfort as multiple mannequins were impaled and sent flying. Cheng Su's impressive display, earned him automatic qualification, as it was Zombie's turn, he was halted by Chen, drawing everyone's attention. Chen questioned Zombie's recommendation by Violet, expressing doubt based on his performance. Chen recalled Zombie's earlier inquiry and pondered whether Zombie might not be human. Zombie vehemently denied the accusations, panicking as he tried to convince Chen of his humanity. Chen, believing in Zombie, hoped he would reveal his true abilities. However, Chen imposed a condition, Zombie must surpass Chengsu to pass the test. Chen's threat unsettled Zombie, who contemplated his actions, recalling his past experiences with individuals pursuing him for his power, seemingly linked to the academy. Zombie refused to be used as someone's source of power, realizing that his life was at stake. With Shang Su and Don anticipating his true strength, 
Zombie positioned himself to throw with precision, recalling his rigorous training. His determination manifested as his left eye turned red, a sign of unleashing his full potential. Serious and focused, Zombie's demeanor warned against underestimating him. With unwavering determination, Zombie launched a spear, shattering the ground with its impact and sending it soaring into outer space. The spear ricocheted off space shuttles until it ultimately struck the moon, a testament to Zombie's incredible strength. The force of his throw sent everyone airborne, yet Zombie remained unaffected, standing calmly amidst the chaos. Shen, visibly stunned, had not anticipated Zombie's monstrous capabilities. Meanwhile, on the moon's surface, Zombie's extraordinary strength was further demonstrated as he pierced through it. In a display of sheer power, Zombie entered, beast mode, showcasing his true abilities. As the dust settled from the throwing range test, Zombie stood unperturbed, his gaze fixed upward as if searching for his target. His remarkable performance left everyone speechless. Don approached Zombie, astounded by his display of strength. Curious about where Zombie had aimed the spear, Don sought answers, but Zombie could only express his efforts to demonstrate his true abilities. The portion of the moon impacted by Zombie's throw became an asteroid, wandering through outer space. With this incredible feat, Zombie automatically qualified for the academy, solidifying his place among the elite. After receiving his certificate, Zombie simply wished to return home. However, in Don's perspective, Zombie was deemed fit to potentially become the president of their academy. Don attempted to persuade Zombie, highlighting the authority he could wield as president. Zombie remains perplexed about the concept of Don, with the explanation being likened to a president. Don proceeded to provide an illustration using President Violet, who holds the position of the head of the swordsmanship department. President Violet's authority extends beyond commanding an army consisting of troops, tanks, aircraft, and long-range cannons, she also possesses control over nuclear warheads. In addition, she holds the highest level of authority over a city inhabited by 30 million people, with the mayor's role being secondary in assisting her with city management. In Zombie's thought, he considers that he already possesses his own city. Inside the academy, Don gave Zombie a tour, showcasing various departments. They arrive at the Department of Biotech, and the Zombie inquires about the purpose of this place. They visited the Biotech Department, where weapons were manufactured, also referred to as the Logistics Department. While exploring, Zombie noticed a picture featuring a happy family, including a man resembling the mad scientist from before. Don introduced the man as Jamie, the former president of the biotech department, whose tragic backstory involved experiments with humans and zombies after his wife's death. As they conversed, a scientist approached, inquiring if they had completed their exam. Don confirmed, while Zombie recognized the woman. Don revealed her as Jamie's adopted daughter and the current president of the biotech department, May. Don excitedly made a request for trousers capable of concealing her Gatling gun, indicating her desire to join the gunner department. Upon receiving Don's request, May directs her attention to the zombie and inquires about his own request. Initially, May fails to recognize the zombie and becomes startled when he asks if she was referring to him. May suddenly panics and shouts that there is a zombie in her office, but Don reassures her that her companion is not a zombie but is simply wearing a mask for some reason. However, May persists in her belief that he is clearly a zombie and even questions if Don's eyes are located in an unconventional place. Excitedly shares that she had seen his face earlier during his javelin throw and thought he was incredibly cool. Eventually, May comes to accept that the zombie is, in fact, a human. She reaches this conclusion based on the fact that if he were truly a zombie, he would have already attacked her. The zombie remains silent, standing there without uttering a word. Returning to her professional duties, May asks the zombie about his equipment requirements. In response, the zombie explains that he doesn't have any specific preferences in mind. He simply notes that whenever he goes out, he somehow always ends up returning home without any clothes. Therefore, his request is for a set of clothes that are durable and won't easily tear. Initially confused, May eventually understands their requests. Don wants to conceal weapons within her body, while the zombie simply wants to avoid being naked. Meanwhile, at the swordsmanship department, Marshall appeared ashamed in the presence of a relaxed woman. Marshall's presence in the swordsmanship department was to file a report regarding his defeat in battle. From Marshall's perspective, he recalled charging into battle, only to have his vision darkened suddenly, followed by waking up naked atop a lamppost. 
The woman he faced expressed certainty that zombies were no match for her, but Marshall remained convinced of their superior strength. Approaching Marshall, the president, Shang Lanky, demanded to know Zombie's name, her glare intimidating. Eventually, she relented and allowed Marshall to leave. Shang Lanky, like Violet, belonged to the Blade Department, continuing a long-standing rivalry with the Sword Department, marked by cutthroat tactics to recruit members. In the present, Marshall expressed his well wishes for Mr. Zombie, acknowledging Lanky's strength akin to Violet's. Later that day, a teacher commenced a lesson on zombie behavior, noting their affinity for eggs and advising on exploiting their weaknesses, particularly their heads, when setting traps. Zombie, diligently taking notes, expressed his intent to share knowledge with his family. Don found this odd until an unexpected gymnasium assembly interrupted the lecture. Violet arrived, cautioning Zombie and Don to behave, as they were her recommendations. During the assembly, curiosity arose about Zombie's ability to eat under his mask. Lanky's arrival prompted further speculation, with a suggestion to test Zombie's capabilities. Another arrival, a scarred man with robot companions, drew reverence from the students. He was revealed as the president of the Mechanical Life Form Department, the Chief. While most respected the Chief, Lanky remained unimpressed, even departing despite their target being present. For Lanky, the Chief's authority outweighed Zombie's significance, as she only respected strength. In contrast, the chief praised Violet's efforts. Violet accepted the praise humbly and reassured the chief that she was simply doing her job. Zombie noticed a strange atmosphere among the department members, particularly when Don, acting childishly, asked Zombie about his favorite popsicle flavor. Without hesitation, Zombie responded that he liked eggs. Curious about the chief's power, Zombie inquired further, and Don informed him that the chief was connected to Jamie, revealing that the chief was Jamie's creation, surviving among thousands of test experiments. After Jaime's expulsion from the academy, the chief established the mechanical life form department and gained control over a city with a population of over 50 million. Under the chief's leadership, no zombies had appeared in the city for 10 years due to his swift actions in eradicating any potential threats. Zombie felt intimidated by the chief, while Don was captivated by his presence. The chief took the stage and addressed the students, emphasizing their importance to the academy, despite being freshmen. The students wondered how they could contribute, and the chief instructed one of his robot assistants to provide a concise explanation through a projection. The projection displayed an image of a captured spy who had nearly caused a nuclear warhead to be deployed against students from Binder's academy. The zombie recognizes the man as the one responsible for dropping the bomb on him. The chief explains that although someone like him should be killed on the spot, they have credible information indicating that the spy is a trusted subordinate of the treacherous Professor Jamie. Upon hearing this, the zombie realizes that their target is not actually the zombies. The zombie asks Don if the threat of the zombies has long subsided and if all the chaos and conflicts are a result of internal conflicts. Don confirms this, stating that some individuals simply desire to witness the world in turmoil. Returning to the chief, he revealed that numerous methods had been attempted to make the spy talk, including torture techniques such as the tiger bench, needles, castration, and drowning. However, none had succeeded. Desperate for a breakthrough, the chief proposed a deal, whoever could make the spy talk would become the vice president. This offer energized the students, and they eagerly volunteered for the mission. The first student was chosen, and the chief wished them luck as they hurriedly set off to interrogate the spy. However, after two hours of futile attempts, the students' desperation grew. Their methods became increasingly unorthodox and desperate, including praying, childish annoyance, and attempts at using supernatural skills. Meanwhile, Violet felt embarrassed for them while Zombie and Don relaxed, enjoying their popsicles. Don asked Zombie if he believed he could make the spy talk, and Zombie, brimming with confidence, boasted that he could. Don was thrilled at the prospect of watching Zombie in action and brought it to the chief's attention, suggesting that Zombie be given a chance. The chief agreed, providing them with the location of the spy. As Zombie stepped forward, Lanky, one of his subordinates, glared at him. Zombie couldn't help but notice that his subordinates had been losing control recently. Sensing an opportunity for answers, Zombie decided to face the spy. However, the spy believed that no one could break him and taunted the academy for running out of capable individuals, sending a zombie-like person to deal with him. In response, zombie attacked the spy, leaving a small scar, which confused the spy. 
He laughed hysterically, believing that provoking Zombie was the only reaction he could elicit. Zombie displayed a grave seriousness and issued a command, compelling him to stand up. Surprisingly, the spy immediately obeyed Zombie's directive. This left Violet, Don, and the chief in a state of shock as they witnessed Zombie effortlessly controlling the unbreakable spy. It turned out that the scar inflicted by Zombie on the spy contained a virus that coursed through his veins, eventually reaching his brain. With this virus, Zombie had the ability to manipulate the spy's mind. Curious, Zombie asked the spy for his name, and the spy promptly responded that his name was Shao Kai. The onlookers were left speechless as they witnessed Zombie's newfound power to control people's minds. Zombie proceeded to ask a personal question about Shao Kai's connection to Jamie, and without hesitation, Shao Kai revealed that he knew a lot of things. When questioned about the random berserk behavior of the zombies, Shao Kai explained that a medicine created by Jamie had been released into the city, causing the zombies to go mad. Furthermore, Jamie had a certain level of control over the zombies through this medicine. In their battles, Jaime's team collected data on the Binders Academy. Zombie inquired about the rebels' motives, but Shao Kai was unaware of Jaime's reasons, only knowing that Jamie was planning something significant. Shao Kai's mission was solely to gather data on the members of the Binders Academy by using the zombies to attack the students. Zombie then asked about Jaime's whereabouts, and Shao Kai readily revealed that Jamie was in a secret base located approximately 500 meters below the city. Lanky was amazed and rendered speechless upon learning that Zombie was far from weak. Before leaving, Zombie commanded Shao Kai to turn around, and in a chilling manner, warned him about the human's hatred. Zombie also disclosed that he had implanted a virus in Shao Kai's brain that could be triggered to induce suicide. Despite being under Zombie's control, Shao Kai acknowledged his understanding. Meanwhile, at Jaime's secret base, located 500 meters beneath the city, they were alerted to the fact that Shao Kai had betrayed them, and the Binders Academy now knew their hideout. Jamie contemplated their next move, feeling relatively at ease as their experiments were nearing completion. The timing was opportune since the Academy was about to come to them, allowing them to witness the historic moment of Jaime's creation of a complete life form. Back at the Academy, Zombie left the room, leaving everyone intimidated and terrified by his display of mind control. Students began to understand that Zombie should not be underestimated. However, Chief, the Academy's leader, applauded Zombie, expressing pride in his remarkable hidden talent. True to his word, Chief fulfilled his promise to make Zombie the next Vice President. Yet, Zombie's focus remained fixed on Jamie. Lanky, feeling somewhat bored, decided to follow Chief and Zombie to the abandoned industrial area. There, she sensed something was amiss, finding the registration process for the vice presidency suspicious. Determined to investigate further, Lanky trailed Chief and Zombie. At the abandoned industrial area, Zombie's curiosity was piqued as he wondered if it would fall under his jurisdiction. Recalling that he needed to complete the registration process and pursue Jamie, Zombie was caught off guard when Chief astutely questioned when he had learned to speak the human language, exposing Zombie's true nature. Acting innocent, Zombie feigned ignorance, but Chief quickly drew his guns and fired at Zombie. Unfortunately, Lanky and her assistant happened to be behind Zombie, and the assistant expressed concern for Lanky's safety. However, Lanky immediately recognized Chief's weapon, capable of disintegrating all matter. Chief realized Zombie's true nature and berated the Academy for allowing a zombie to infiltrate their ranks. It appeared as though Zombie had been decapitated, leading Chief to believe that he had eliminated the threat, as zombies were known to be vulnerable in their heads. Apologizing for killing Zombie, Chief explained that he had no choice, as Zombie had breached the Academy's restricted premises. However, Chief soon realized that Zombie had not been defeated. Suddenly, Zombie launched a surprise attack on Chief, slamming him against a building and leaving him injured. Chief's robot assistants arrived on the scene and fired lasers at Zombie, causing an explosion in the abandoned area. Undeterred, Zombie grabbed hold of the robots and threw them aside, destroying the highly advanced machines. Chief felt a sense of unease as Zombie, despite being headless, continued to fight back. Chief wondered how Zombie was able to move an attack without a head. Lanky and her subordinate were amazed by Zombie's resilience and ability to fight. Zombie relentlessly attacked Chief, but Chief managed to dodge his strikes. The Chief swiftly drew another weapon with his right hand and unleashed a powerful blast at Zombie, who deftly avoided the attack by lowering his upper body. 
Growing increasingly irritated, the chief couldn't help but wonder how Zombie remained so fast even without his head. Zombie retaliated with an uppercut, but the chief skillfully evaded it, distancing himself and acknowledging the threat Zombie posed. Aware of Zombie's capabilities, the chief made sure not to underestimate him. Lanky's subordinate expressed concern for the chief, sensing trouble, but Lanky reassured him that the chief was just beginning to take the situation seriously. As the chief stood there, his demeanor seemingly serious, Lanky remarked that individuals like him often like to showcase their abilities with grandiose moves. She wisely decided to move a bit further away to avoid being caught in the potential area of effect of the chief's weaponry. Zombie's head regenerated, prompting a sigh of relief from him as his head returned to its normal state. Lanky and her subordinate were surprised by this unexpected turn of events. Zombie urged the chief to engage in dialogue, expressing a desire to avoid causing harm. The chief remained silent for a moment, contemplating the situation. Finally, he replied, surmising that Zombie sought to control his mind. With resolve, he removed his jacket, indicating his readiness to confront Zombie head-on. Suddenly, the chief model one flew towards him, ready to assist. Resembling an Iron Man suit, it scattered in the air before swiftly assembling around the chief's body. Zombie was bewildered, patiently awaiting the transformation that unfolded before him. Lanky's subordinate was in awe, witnessing the chief's remarkable metamorphosis. As the dust settled, the chief emerged clad in the suit, resembling Iron Man. Introducing himself as a mechanical life form, he charged towards Zombie, declaring his refusal to engage in conversation with the undead. With precision, he struck Zombie's chin with his toe, emphasizing the honor bestowed upon Zombie as the first witness to his transformed state. In the aftermath of the attack, the chief found himself positioned behind Zombie. As Zombie continued to backflip through the air due to the force, the chief swiftly launched another attack, striking Zombie in the stomach and sending him hurtling far away. Lanky and her subordinate remained transfixed, amazed by the chief's exceptional skills displayed in the ongoing battle. In the next moment, the chief pursued Zombie through the air, striking him once more as Zombie was sent flying. The relentless assault continued, with the chief refusing to give Zombie a chance to retaliate. After a flurry of attacks in midair, the chief eventually drove Zombie back to the ground. As Zombie's body crashed onto the ground, it bounced slightly due to the force of impact. Undeterred, the chief followed up, landing on the ground. His mechanical eye glowed bright red as he crossed his arms, seemingly gathering energy before releasing a powerful blast from his chest. Lanky was taken aback by the sudden display of power, and the blast grew even larger, causing chaos in the abandoned area. Buildings were decimated by the sheer force of the attack. Confident that Zombie should have been defeated by now, the chief surveyed the aftermath. However, to everyone's disbelief, Zombie's legs emerged from the dust and smoke, indicating his survival of the supposedly lethal attack. This defied all expectations, leaving witnesses in shock. Still concealed within the smoke, Zombie unleashed a powerful force akin to a Super Saiyan, transforming into another level, emitting a deafening shout and generating a blast of wind that caught Lanky and her subordinate off guard. Leaving them confused, the chief clicked his tongue in disappointment, noticing cracks in his armor's faceplate. Zombie underwent yet another transformation, with his hair growing longer. Onlookers were stunned by these unexpected developments as Zombie's gaze turned towards the chief, now exuding a different aura. Shocked by Zombie's transformation, the chief couldn't help but question what exactly Zombie had become. Standing cool and collected, Zombie had leveled up, presenting a formidable challenge to his enemy. The sky began spiraling while Zombie stood motionless on the ground. The spiral grew larger, eventually encompassing the entire city. The spectacle caught the attention of Don and even alarmed Lanky who had been calm just moments ago. The citizens failed to notice the immense spiral in the sky. Chief was left speechless and intimidated, while Zombie meant every word he said. Zombie even offered Chief a chance to peacefully resolve the situation, but Chief refused to listen. Chief was confused, and Zombie asked Chief in a chilling manner how he wanted to meet his demise. Lanky and her subordinate noticed that Zombie's personality had undergone a complete 180 degree change, giving Lanky an ominous feeling. They immediately left the area to avoid getting caught up in the impending danger. Chief had never felt threatened by anyone since birth and acted tough, pretending not to be afraid of Zombie. Chief continued to provoke Zombie and even dared him to come at him, while Lanky and her subordinate ran away. 
Lanky's subordinate informed her that he had searched through Zombie's database but had never encountered a creature as formidable as Zombie. They hoped to find safety away from Zombie, but soon realized they were caught up in the chaos. As Chief's limbs were torn off and he was smashed into the ground, Zombie approached him. However, Chief summoned his robotic allies, Models 2, 3, and 4, creating a massive explosion. Lanky found herself caught beside Chief in that moment. Chief asked Lanky for assistance, knowing the danger that Zombie posed. However, Lanky was deeply frightened and considered Chief insane for provoking Zombie in the first place. Lanky advised her subordinate and Chief to split up and escape, recognizing that Zombie wouldn't simply let them get away. Just as Zombie was about to charge his next attack, Lanky noticed his intentions and realized they were in danger. Zombie struck the ground with tremendous force, causing an earthquake that made Lanky lose her balance and fall. She was deeply horrified and confused by the situation. However, Zombie wasn't finished yet. He lifted the ground, causing half of the city to float in the air. Panic spread among the citizens, and even Don was mesmerized by the sight of the floating city. Meanwhile, on Zombie's side, he fell to the ground and hit his head hard. Reacting swiftly, Zombie immediately went after Chief. He smirked as he held Chief, who was now limbless, on his head and taunted him, asking if Chief felt more threatened. Zombie firmly believed that he couldn't control the mind of a robot, but Chief wasn't a pure machine. Despite his limbs being mechanical, Chief still had a human brain. Zombie tightened his grip on Chief's head, using the same technique he had employed on the spy earlier. He wanted to intrude into Chief's mind and access his memories. As the virus began to infiltrate Chief's brain, Zombie observed Chief's memories. The first image he saw was of two adults in a silhouette figure, followed by Chief's childhood days as an orphan with his deceased parents in front of him. The memory then shifted to a doctor performing a body modification surgery on Chief. In Chief's memory, there was a moment when his human parts were all removed and replaced with mechanical components. After glimpsing Chief's memories, Zombie insulted him, mocking Chief for his misery and claiming that he was more undead than a zombie himself. Zombie made the decision to spare Chief, believing that Chief would suffer more if he remained alive rather than being dead. Growing bored, Zombie casually tossed Chief onto the top of a cliff. Luckily, Lanky was able to catch Chief with a horrified expression on her face. Lanky was shocked to witness one of Zombie's abilities, which involved reading memories. Suddenly, Zombie disappeared, and later that night, he returned to his usual self. Filled with shame and regret over losing control of his emotions, Zombie packed his belongings to run away. He was scared of himself and tried to convince himself that he was a friendly and kind zombie, but he felt ashamed to face humanity. As he walked out the door, Violet caught him attempting to sneak away, but Zombie had no choice but to silence her as a witness. Zombie began to apologize for what he was about to do, but Violet interrupted him by showing him a document. The document stated that he was officially appointed as the vice president of Binder's Academy. This revelation confused Zombie, as he wondered why no one reacted violently to his earlier outburst. He was even more perplexed when he discovered that Chief had given his consent for Zombie to hold the position of vice president. Curious about Chief's thoughts on him, Zombie asked Violet if Chief had ever mentioned anything about him. Violet answered by explaining that Chief regarded Zombie as a good person, and she didn't react violently to the news. In fact, she congratulated Zombie on his recent achievements. Meanwhile, Chief was bedridden with Lanky by his side. Lanky believed it was a terrible mistake for Chief to allow Zombie to stay, despite knowing the truth about Zombie's true nature. However, Chief looked at the situation from a different perspective. It didn't matter to him whether Zombie was a human or not. Chief focused more on the opportunities and advantages that having Zombie on their side could bring. Lanky was more concerned about the possibility of Zombie going berserk again, but Chief was still willing to take the risk. He changed the topic and asked Lanky about the necessary arrangements, even though he was completely defeated. Chief's thoughts still revolved around Professor Jamie. He made a personal promise to himself that he would completely eliminate any trace of Professor Jamie, ensuring that the professor would be gone for good. Meanwhile, news spread among the zombie society that Zombie was being held captive within a human city. Varmint, a loyal member of the zombie society, sought advice from his fellow companions on how to rescue their leader. The entire zombie society contemplated the idea of exterminating all the humans in order to save their king. Blackie, however, considered Varmint's concerns and protests to be foolish, 
as Blackie and Agu were well aware of Zombie's extraordinary and monstrous power. Back at Binder's Academy, Chief had fully recovered and regained his limbs. He made a public announcement, urging everyone to prepare themselves, as this was finally their opportunity to capture Professor Jamie. Meanwhile, in a land city, Zombie and Don were walking when they encountered a group of soldiers who blocked their path. Surprisingly, the soldiers were there to formally welcome Zombie to his new city, which would be under his rule. They are part of the Central Command's 4th Division, the 56th Regiment. The soldiers pledged to follow Zombie's orders from that point forward, leaving Zombie in shock at how quickly things had unfolded, without even asking for his achievements in the first place. The soldiers stood in formation, greeting their newest vice president, Zombie. The 56th Regiment consists of 12,000 individuals, and the captain is requesting the vice president to officially acknowledge them as part of his unit. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button for more content. Feel free to leave a comment down below sharing your thoughts or suggestions. If you want to stay updated on all our latest uploads, click the notification bell icon. And hey, why not check out some of our other videos popping up on the screen right now. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so by liking, sharing, and subscribing. It really means a lot, peace.